Hi everyone, my name is Megan and this presentation is about problem solving strategies and learning as seen in the video game The Witness. Uh, a little bit about me before we start. My background is primarily in education and hence my interest in learning within video games. Uh, so before we begin, there's sort of two sections to this presentation. One about the different types of problem solving strategies that players use and the other about uh, looking at ways, different ways of representing difficulty and learning curves within games. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the video game The Witness, it's a puzzle video game sort of akin to Myst, where you are on an abandoned island and you need to solve a series of puzzles. The puzzles come in the form of puzzle panels where the player must draw a line from the starting circle to the ending tail. Different puzzles use different symbols to uh, refer to different puzzle mechanics or different rules. And the player needs to figure out what these rules are uh, by solving the puzzles. There's pretty much no text or direct instruction used in this game and it's uh, all learning by discovery. As you move throughout the game, the puzzles do start really simple and move to being very complex, mixing different puzzle mechanics and rules together, all really targeting and testing player understanding. <laughs> so this list of player problem solving strategies is heavily based around the work of IACOVIDS, which I will add to the reference list, and uh, also my own research on top of that. So in the context of one person playing the game alone we saw there are six different uh, problem solving strategies that have been observed there might be more let us know <laughs> um, and within the context of two or more players whether this be multiplayer games or uh, multiple people playing within the same physical location uh, we also saw three additional problem solving strategies used but these ones rely on interaction between people so are not observed when there's only one person playing by themselves so i'll quickly run you through examples of each of these strategy strategies and, and sort of try and differentiate between the different uh, categories so trial and error is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it is the player just trying a bunch of stuff and seeing what works. In The Witness, the first few puzzles for each new mechanic are designed to be solved through trial and error alone uh, to allow the player to experience some success, but also to build up a pattern uh, that they can then build on in the next step. So following trial and error, we would expect to see players start experimenting, coming up with a hypothesis or an idea of how these symbols work and then testing that out and seeing if they can figure out the answer. In this particular case, the player spends quite a long time on this particular puzzle, but once they have figured out the rule for the black and white squares, the next few puzzles, although more complex, uh, because the player understands they are able to solve them quite quickly. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that the player is spending a long time here experimenting. The rule for the black and white squares in the witness is that they must be separated by the player's line or the boundaries of the puzzle. So you'll see for these next few puzzles, because the player understands the rule, they're able to solve them quite quickly. Now this particular strategy, I'll just turn this down, was not observed in the witness because the witness uh, doesn't require skillful input of controls. So I am showing you an example from Untitled Goose Game. In this example, the player is the goose, is trying to steal the keys from the hip of the gardener. They do fail the first two times, but nearly succeed. So they are, um, I guess, confident that this strategy as a whole will succeed. It's just that their execution did not work out. So eventually on the third try, they do get it. So they had to repeat an action in game in order to uh, so successfully solve that puzzle. Another thing could be, for example, in platformers where players have to practice a series of jumps or things like that in order to 
pull them off successfully. Another strategy is stop and think. And just like the name suggests, it involves players stopping what they are doing to reflect on their actions and perhaps think of new ideas. They may pause the game or stand still within the game while they think. Stop and think also includes players seeking help from an external source of information, including Googling for a hint or looking through an instruction manual or something similar. This is not, uh, this does not include asking another person for help as that comes into the multiplayer strategies, but just seeking help from an external source of information. In order to capture this, I had to change uh, my methods a little bit and make sure I recorded the whole display of the computer rather than just capturing the window of the game. Another strategy that's really interesting is called take the hint, whereby the player uh, pays attention to or sees a hint within the game. So in the witness at the very, very start of the game, the controls, so left click, for example, pops up in the bottom right corner there. Uh, I'll play it again so you can see. There are also white circles appearing where the player should click to start and finish the puzzle so that the player understands you have to start at the big circle and head to the tail. There are also audio cues, which are a little hard to hear in my video, uh, but they're to reinforce. However, uh, Take the Hint has issues, as when the hints are too subtle, that it's very easy for a majority of players, even experienced players, to miss. So in this case, uh, this player successfully sees the hint. So after solving this puzzle, uh, one of the conventions is that players follow these cables which light up once uh, they have been activated. So this puzzle panel is not activated, but this player follows the lit up green cable to find the next sequence of symmetry puzzles. However, there were quite a few players observe missing this clue, perhaps because generally the lit up cable had flowed from the puzzle that was just finished, whereas in this case it was connected to just skip ahead, sorry. <laughs> In this case, the cable was connected to the start of this particular sequence, which may have led to the subsequent confusion by multiple players. So you can see this player, although it looks like they've seen the lit up green cable, they kind of walk right past and don't turn around to look back to see the next set of puzzles. So I think there's two easy solutions to this problem, either move the green cable to be connected to that end, the puzzle on the end there, or have that next sequence be on that first face of that white cube that the players have to see as they walk past. Another example of take the hint in the witness is that many player, uh, many puzzles, not all, but many use environmental clues. And these are really subtle and very easy to miss. And I know this is partly intentional within this game, but it may or may not be intentional to be subtle in another game. In this case, this is the first puzzle in the orchid, which looks like a tree and the player must use the tree nearby, which you can see in the background and look towards the apple for a clue as to what the answer is. However, I have, I did observe even very experienced game players brute forcing the solution to these puzzles and not even noticing that the tree had an apple in it or that the tree was the same shape as the puzzle panel. And these, this is one of the more obvious environmental clues. So um, both novice and experienced players miss these subtle clues. Another strategy that I observed was players taking a break. Uh, this would be where they stopped solving a puzzle to go explore a different section of the game and solve another puzzle, or stopped playing the game completely just to have a break and come back to it later. Moving on to the multiplayer strategies, uh, the audio on this one's muted to protect the identity of my participants. Um, but you can see myself and a participant discussing the puzzle and next steps and what was going wrong with it. So 
Knowledge exchange in a multiplayer context is when both players are working together from the same base level of knowledge about the puzzle in that neither has an advantage and neither player knows more. Um, although I had played this puzzle before, it was a long time and I couldn't remember. Um, so we were trying to work together to figure out the answer. This is different from guidance. I didn't have a video example of this, but I do have a transcript whereby one or more players have more knowledge than another and are providing hints um, or solutions to the other less knowledgeable player. This more no knowledgeable status can be very flexible and vary between players depending on which sections of the game they have completed compared to others. The other last multiplayer strategy which was rare, only seen once in my study and is kind of uh, was so I would consider rare uh, was surrender or take control where one player surrenders their controls to another uh, in this case a more experienced player W took over controls for L uh, at her request he completed a few puzzles and then gave the gave the controls back to L for me I think this strategy would would probably only be seen if players are sharing a physical space. I'm not sure how it would work if they were playing online together, um, as I'm not sure how one player would be able to take control over another player unless uh, the game allowed for that. Now this section is very qualitative and exploratory and needs a lot more work, but the general differences between novices and experts that I saw was that novices did sometimes take longer to learn controls. They were less, uh, some of them were only familiar with touch-based casual games. So hadn't you done a first person computer game before and had to learn how to do W, A, S, D and a mouse at the same time. They seem to ask for help more readily uh, versus an expert. On the flip side, experts were very comfortable with the controls, picked them up very quickly, did were observed bringing knowledge over from other games. Um, Interestingly, some experts didn't ask for help because they saw it as a point of pride that they wanted to solve the puzzle by themselves and, and experience that satisfaction. Um, they also had developed preferences for game genres. So a lot of my participants who were more experienced players mentioned that they did not choose to play puzzle games usually. Uh, and what I found was that their f tolerance level for failing and, and sort of frustration seemed to be lower for a puzzle game versus a game that was one of their favorites, such as maybe they preferred an MMO or a strategy game or an FPS game. They were more willing to put up with frustration in their favorite games than in the puzzle game. In the second segment of this talk, I wanted to talk about learning curves. Now, there's no real definitive way to measure learning, but we're kind of going to try our best. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, a lot of people have, in game design have heard about flow theory. So it's all about making sure the challenges within the game are at an ideal level of challenge for the player. So not too easy and not too hard. And then within that a zone where a player would experience flow use, even then you sort of want the difficulty of your puzzles or challenges to fluctuate to get the most engagement out of the player. Now, I sort of looked at, took Connor Linehan's work around representing the pace and challenge of games and tried to apply this to the witness. So initially, uh, and I'll, again, I'll link it in the reference list, but they looked at Portal, Portal 2, Braid and Lemmings. And what they came up with is measuring the challenge or the pace of the game using the ideal number of moves required for, to solve each level within these games. Uh, and it shows a pretty good map of the difficulty of the puzzles across the games. And you can see them fluctuating, starting off quite easy, ending up quite hard, but with some fluctuation in the middle. Each time a new skill is introduced, represented by the yellow spots, uh, you'll find a few easier puzzles there as well. I tried this with the witness. And so, for example, for this puzzle, I would count each time the lion turned a corner as one move. So this puzzle would be, uh, this puzzle would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, about 14 moves. This is the graph I came up with. 
I was a little surprised and a bit concerned because it does not look like any of the other graphs. And in fact, it's suggesting that the first few puzzles of this sequence, which is the Symmetry Island sort of puzzles within the Witness game, quite near the start of the game, that the first few puzzles are the most difficult. And I know for a fact that these are some of the most easiest. So this measure did not work for the Witness. So I tried to look for one that did. Um, so let, let's compare two puzzles. So I've got one, the one that required the most number of moves and one that was sort of uh, about average, but sitting in the middle of the sequence of symmetry puzzles. So puzzle 1.5 requires, uh, I think it's about 17 moves, but it's just a straightforward maze from start to finish, avoiding the blockages and taking into account a second reflected line. Ref imagine there's a mirror sort of right down the middle there takes the player 17 moves. It's fairly straightforward and takes about 10 seconds to solve. Puzzle 5.6 is a little more complicated. Not only is the yellow reflected line reflected twice, so uh, vertically and horizontally, the lines also have to collect their respective colored hexagons uh, and the black hexagons can be collected by either line. This puzzle requires a lot more thought, but is only 12 moves. So how could I represent difficulty using a different measure? The moves measure was not working for this particular game. So I tried uh, looking at, I had about 10 participants fully play through the symmetry area and I had uh, play through videos for each participant. And from those videos, I measured how long each participant had spent on these puzzles. This was a mix of participants of age and gameplay experience. And you can see this puzzle is looking a lot more like the original puzzles with the, the beginner level puzzles being the easiest. And you'll see the green lines are sort of where a new idea is introduced. And around the times a new idea is introduced, the difficulty also decreases. So I thought the time average time taken for the participants to solve these puzzles was a much better measure for the witness. Um, now, ignoring the height difference between the graphs, because the vertical scale is sort of arbitrary between the two different lines, but comparing the shapes, um, you can see how the blue line much better reflects the difficulty. I also combined that with the second measure, which was the number of incorrect solutions players submitted. So the witness allows players to submit an incorrect solution and often gives feedback on these. And so I could see that um, where players were spending more time on each puzzle, they were also often submitting more incorrect solutions. So you can see the last few puzzles in the sequence were the most difficult and they required a lot of thinking about reflecting and also a lot of um, short-term memory or, uh, you know, writing things down uh, to carry information between multiple puzzle panels. So you can see there that I think this line really matches the lines that Line and, and Co had made for Braid and Lemmings and Portal. So what this leads me to believe is that different measures can reveal different things about the puzzles and difficulty levels in our games. And you need to be careful about which measures you use. And it really depends on the type of game that you're looking at. So if your game has puzzles where there are, are like an ideal number of moves, uh, the number of moves you use to solve um, can help represent the difficulty of that puzzle. But for the witness, that was always going to be the same number of moves to solve for each player. So that solution was, uh, that sort of measure didn't really work. And the number of moves required didn't uh, equ equate to difficulty. Uh, average time taken to solve worked really well for the witness, but as I found uh, for Untitled Goose Game, it's not working for me because players can actually work on multiple puzzles at one time. So it's much harder to go through and measure how long each player spent on each particular puzzle. Average number of incorrect solutions submitted works really well, but it requires the game allowing a player to submit an incorrect solution, which isn't always the case. Um, the average time taken and average incorrect solutions also require play testing. Now you could do that with either AI or uh, actual users. So some things to consider, just what we talked about, um, which 
measure is going to work best for the type of puzzles you have in your game. It's not always going to be the same. And maybe you could even come up with some new measures that would work better than these ones. Um, so the benefit I found to having actual users playtest the games and observing was being able to see where players actually experienced challenge rather than where I thought or where a designer might think they will experience the most challenge. So using actual data showcased where the challenging sections were. Players, uh, sorry, myself or, or designers uh, could then dive down into those difficult sections and try and figure out why they are difficult. Was that intended to be dif a difficult puzzle or were players just missing a really obvious clue? You could then use that to fine tune your design. So coming back, uh, looking at everything as a whole, um, and for me as a teacher, it's always coming back to what do you want the student, or in this case, the player, to get out of the game? Do you want to test or have them build knowledge or skill or a mix of both? Because depending on what you really want to test would change how you design the puzzle. For example, if you really want to test knowledge, it might be a good idea to remove time limits. This makes uh, gives players space to think and not pressure them to, um, not put them under time pressure. If you want to test their skills, it's really good to think about having a consequence free space for them to practice inputting the controls into the game and getting better at the control section of the game. So that could be a tutorial area or a practice area that they can revisit at other points in the game. Um, I found with the witness, the witness has previous solutions easily visible and accessible to players. So across different play sessions, it was really easy for participants to go back and look at their previous solutions to rejog their memory if they forgot what the rule for the black and white squares was or something like that. So think about having those available to players who are returning for a new play session and perhaps have forgotten some of the elements of what they had done previously. Other things to think about. Uh, is having multiple avenues or multiple things that players can go and do at one time, having a choice in which puzzles they approach. When you have a purely linear line of puzzles, if players get frustrated and quit on a particular puzzle, they're more likely to quit the game and then never come back. Uh, whereas if they had two or three different puzzles they could try, uh, often players would perhaps stop one puzzle but go and try another one and come back to the original. That was observed quite often and was very common behavior. So thinking about, you don't have to have a non-linear storyline, but having some non-linear puzzle solving. I mean, there were still linear elements to it, as you see in The Witness, um, but there was sort of freedom of choices to which uh, type of puzzles a player could approach. Uh, also, Untitled Goose Game and The Witness made some of the more challenging puzzles optional to progression within the game. So players could still experience success and finish the story, even if they couldn't solve the more challenging puzzles. But a perfectionist player would still go through and all go come back and solve those more challenging ones. But it allowed more players to finish the game and experience success and the um, satisfying feeling of finishing the game. If you're having finding players are having trouble with some of your puzzles, make your in-game hints more obvious. I can't emphasize enough how subtle hints sometimes just do not get through to the player. So use more avenues of communication, add audio pings, add more visual flashes or things, play test those extra things that you've added in and see if the players have now got the clue. Or you could have it such that after X number of incorrect solutions submitted, more hints start appearing um, to get to you know try and guide players towards the correct idea. Um, the penalty for failure within the problem solving or puzzle games will impact what strategies players use to solve problems. So just keep that in mind. So the witness had pretty much no penalty for failure. So players were encouraged to experiment and submit incorrect solutions in order to get feedback. But if there was a penalty for failure, that strategy would not be viable. Uh, I will put up a list of references in the description for this video if you're interested in further reading. But hopefully I can answer some of your questions if you have any. Uh, but thanks for listening and feel free to get in touch if you have further questions.